further debate. The member for Toronto Danforth. Speaker, thanks very much. It's my pleasure to rise to address Bill 276, the Supporting Recovery and Competitive Act, Competitiveness Act 2021. And I had an opportunity to listen to the Associate Minister of Small Business earlier today when he spoke about this bill, and he talked at length about how this bill will help small business. I, find, I found his comments quite ironic, uh, particularly given his government's recent actions opening up restaurants, opening up restaurant patios against the warnings of public health experts who knew and told us all that COVID was surging and that they shouldn't be opened. They were open nonetheless, and that badly hurt restaurants across this province. Within weeks, the Premier, who ignored the experts, had to go back and shut down those very patios, those very restaurants. And that badly hurt those restaurants. Restaurants Canada has come out and said the cost of reopening prematurely and then having to shut down shortly afterwards cost restaurants in, Canada, in Ontario $100 million. Wow. Exactly what they said last week's abrupt move to shut down restaurant dining so soon after easing restrictions has cost Ontario's restaurants more than $100 million in reopening and closing costs alone. Wow. It's a lot of money. Sure is. Amongst other things, Restaurants Ontario was saying that restaurants are asking for funds to reimburse them for the cost of reopening and closing down again in the circumstances. In my writing, there, is, there are a number of business improvement associations but the riding, the restaurants in the BIA Broadview Danforth reported to me that many of them lost in the range of $10,000 from one, that one session of premature reopening and then having to close when the information that had been given to the Premier, which had been ignored, turned out to be entirely accurate. So one restaurant wrote to me, we lost $12,000. This is for the cost of getting open, that's product, cleaning, labor, and other necessary supplies, and then being stuck with a whole lot of inventory after being closed. It should be noted bringing everybody back, only to have to lay them off again in a few weeks, and subsequently cover payroll without having any funds coming in was a major expense. The government needs to understand that the cost of opening and closing, especially closing, is far more expensive than just being closed. It takes probably two months to recuperate the money it costs to get open, never mind how much it costs to close again, and be stuck with thousands of dollars of inventory that it's impossible to sell. Effectively, all this reopening did was leave us with a bunch of bills and just enough sales to reduce the amount of subsidies we qualify for. Speaker, the minister can bring in all the bills he wants and make all the nice speeches he wants, but as long as the government does, have, does not have a coherent and effective response to the pandemic, as long as they ignore the science and go with the Premier's gut, small businesses will keep bleeding money and closing for good. <laughs> Speaker, the government got into deep trouble for the new COVID restrictions they brought in on Friday. They didn't please anybody. You had criticism coming from all corners. There were legal challenges looming. And you had a weekend where the government was backpedaling, saying first, yeah, they, that was real overreach on playgrounds, and then we made a big mistake on policing, so we're gonna back off. It was quite extraordinary to me, Speaker, because you can't actually have a functioning economy if you don't have a healthy population. If people are fighting disease all over the place, if you've got packed hospitals, if you've got a situation where people don't have confidence that they can go out in public and be safe, you are undermining your economy. And this government does not understand that. It has not yet made keeping Ontario safe its highest priority. Defending its special interests, that's another matter. That priority is very clear but actually looking after people is not there. I asked the Solicitor General, well, I asked the Premier this morning, Solicitor General answered, about who on earth thought this was a good idea 
to randomly check people on the street to see whether or not they were on their way to work, on their way to a pharmacy or a grocery store. And what I got back from the Solicitor General was not an answer to my question, it was a deflection. She said, if people are assembling unlawfully, then we need to have the police powers to intervene. Well, I don't think that's the issue, frankly. And the, the indication from the Solicitor General that she had to deflect said to me everything I needed to know. This was an indefensible policy, and they figured it out finally. Speaker, as you're well aware, police departments across Ontario said, you've got to be kidding. This is a poison chalice. We don't want it. So not only, not only did they completely miss out, not only did they anger people all over Ontario, but then the police departments wisely said, we don't want anything to do with this, nothing to do with it. In any event, we have a premier who says, it's up to me to make the tough choices. Well, the tough choice, Speaker, is to actually follow what the scientists and public health experts recommend and drive through a program that will actually protect Ontarians. And that is not what has been happening. If you really care about keeping Ontario open, if you care about protecting people in this province, then you need to have paid sick days. The provincial level is the level that has responsible responsibility for employment standards. We're the jurisdiction, the level that can make those laws. We're a jurisdiction that can put money forward if you don't have a sentiment that supports requiring employment standards paid sick leave, then put money into a bank that employers can draw on. But you have to have paid sick leave so that people will stay home, not go to work if they're ill, and that is one of the key things that's needed to drive down the incidence of disease, and this government has ignored that continuously. It was a complete shock to people in the medical community, including members of the government's own science table, that it did not, in fact, carry forward the recommendations that had been made. I mean, we're looking at a situation where COVID cases, hospitalizations, are, per, are going to be continuing to climb. We're looking at uh, what? Up to 30,000 new cases per day by June if what we have are weak public health measures and 100,000 vaccine doses administered daily. We can't vaccinate our way out of this. You have to have really comprehensive and viable public health measures. That's what you have to have if you want to protect businesses. But that's not what this government has been doing. It's just not where they're at. It's not their focus. And, Speaker, if we're going to have more bills like this, we all have to recognize that having these bills, even if they're embossed, even if they have monks who are illuminating each section <laughs> with pictures of you know, happy peasants plowing fields, is not going to actually stop the pandemic and set up the conditions for a thriving economy. And that, that is really critical. Speaker, there are a lot of things to take on on this bill, and I'm going to focus in most of the time remaining on the government's doubling down on attacking climate action. But before I want to go there, I want to talk about the section that provides nonprofit organizations the power to hold remote or virtual board meetings to carry on their business. And that is in the really wonderful Schedule 17, Not-for-Profit Corporations Act 2010. And it sets out that certain provisions of the Act are temporarily suspended, uh, that there are temporary replacement provisions, and those provisions address, among other things, the holding of meetings of members and directors by telephonic or electronic means and voting at meetings by alternate means, i.e., they're going to be allowed to meet virtually, just as the Parliament of Canada meets virtually, just as the Council of the City of Toronto meets virtually, just as I'm sure many other councils meet virtually across this province. Why? Well, we're in a pandemic. It's a good idea to keep people at a distance where it's technically possible to do that. 
You're well aware, Speaker, that we in the NDP have been pushing hard for a virtual legislature because we want to reduce the transmission of disease. We want to get the pandemic behind us. And it makes tons of sense to make this available to nonprofits. I mean, tons and tons of sense. I, I'm glad it's in here. But, Speaker, if we're going to do it there, why on earth are we not doing it here in the legislature? Is the government so scared of question period that they would rather shut down the House than actually have a virtual legislature? Yeah. Some will say to me, well, it's an emergency, and it is true. But I will point out that Winston Churchill actually attended and answered question period at the height of the Blitz in World War II. I will point out that we have had legislatures sit through World War I, which was without a doubt an emergency. So I think if our great grandmothers, our grandmothers, our grandparents were able to hold legislatures in the midst of war, that we can figure out how to do it in the midst of a pandemic. And I call on the government to, in fact, do what it can to reduce interaction of people by making this a virtual legislature. Speaker, in the time remaining, I want to talk about the parts of this bill that support the government's rollback of climate action. And you know this is a government that doesn't want to act on climate. Yep. I mean, I, there's no mystery. It's not something that's hidden. It's not a government that embraces science. We've seen that with the pandemic. We know that climate damage costs Ontario about $5 billion a year currently, and we know the projection is we're going to hit about $40 billion a year within the next 30 years. We're consistently going to see more and more damage from extreme weather, from fire, from drought. It's going to hurt our economy. It's going to hurt our standard of living. It's going to hurt people. And we need to act. Today, I heard members of the government speak glowingly about the potential for mineral development for electric cars. Now, I, I am glad people remember that. It was only you know, within the last few hours. <laughs> Speaker, this is the government that took a meat axe to electric charging yes. points for cars in GO parking lots. This is a government that changed the building code so that new homes don't have to have electric vehicle charging points. This is a government that cancelled the subsidies so that middle class, middle income people could buy non-luxury electric cars so that we could grow the market. Finally, the government's figured out, oh geez, there's a whole new wave of technology coming at us. The global auto industry is moving to electric. Oh, maybe we should get on board. Well, two years ago, you should have recognized that we needed to build the market for these vehicles here. We needed to build them here so that we have work. And when, when you consistently miss what's going on in the world economy because of ideological blinders, you undermine this province. You undermine this province. So you've done your best to undermine electric cars. Now you could do some things right now. This bill could have restoration of those electric vehicle charging points in GO stations. You could bring back a requirement that new homes have electric vehicle charging points built into them. You could bring in subsidies for people to buy new electric cars. You could make the market grow in Ontario so that investors who want to make electric vehicles see us as a place where they'll be sold, where they'll be purchased. And you know what? I'll just throw in. You can put in electric vehicle charging points in government parking lots where people come and park their cars when they're coming to work or where you have a government fleet. You could do that as well. If you're actually interested in catching the wave of what's happening in the world with new technology production, you could act. So far, the only thing you've done is take a position that the horse and buggy were good. We need to go back there, and <laughs> that, that really is the way to go. So, the mistake they made regarding electric cars is totally representative of the negative approach on climate action. And this act further reinforces that. So I'll talk a bit about the government's record. 
allocated $30 million to fight carbon pricing. <laughs> While you blew that, yeah, Supreme Court kicked you out of the room. Let's face it. Any, when I was at the press conference when the minister at the time was asked, do you think you can win in court on this? And she would not answer that question. Oh man, someone was waving cobras in her face and she was backing off <laughs> because she knew she was going to lose. Yep. She could figure it out. She's had some history as a lawyer. Anyway, so this is a government that's willing to wave around a lot of bucks to show the ideological flag, we hate action on climate change. They spent 100,000 bucks to hire a climate-denying Trump consultant to advise them on their not-so-sticky gas pump decal case in court. I mean, this was a guy who was so wacky that he attacked the Republican caucus in Congress for saying climate change might be real. Man, where do you find these people? Like, why do you go looking for them, and then how do you find them? And why do you pay them? It's crazy. Uh, then, yeah, why do you pay them? Why do you pay them? Uh, most recently, like last week, Environment Canada had to report to the United Nations on emissions in Canada. We have to do that as part of our commitments under international treaties. What I want to tell you, in order to take on climate change, every year the emissions have to go down. And by the end of 2019, the climate plan that was brought forward by the Conservatives had been in place for about a year and a half. Emissions didn't go down. They stayed the same as they had the year before. That is a failure. That is a failure. And that's the reality. The Auditor General, the Auditor General talked at the end of 2020 in her report about the government's failing climate plan. And what she had to say, and I'll, I'll read what she had to say so you get the word straight from her, is that the government's climate plan is understood to be a joke by all the ministries and is ignored. I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, the headline on her media release was, Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions, Not Yet an Ontario Cross-Government Priority, Auditor General. Sometimes Auditor Generals are just too discreet. <laughs> like they, they could have said, this climate plan is still at the back of the filing cabinet and no one ever looks at it. That would have been a more um, straightforward headline, but not yet a priority is about as gentle as you can get. And what did she have to say? The government and its agencies, <laughs> man, I, I don't know, I don't know. And its agencies will have to do more to tackle greenhouse gas emissions from homes and other buildings across the province that plans on hitting its climate change target. Well, when you look at the numbers, it's not in the ballpark to hit that target. Like, the pitch is coming, and their, their batter is up in the bleachers. Now, they ain't going to hit this sucker. Um, she wrote, our audit found the province risks missing its 2030 emission reduction target, in part because climate change and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions is not yet a cross-government priority, said Lissick. My apologies, Speaker. I just have to have a sip of water. My colleague from Algoma, Manitoulin is right. It gets pretty dry. Even when you're really good. <laughs> um, the report uh, found that neither the Ministry of Energy, nor the Development Mines, nor the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing assesses or enforces compliance with its building energy efficiency programs despite risks of non-compliance. What they found was that those ministries just are not doing anything. Uh, her words were more gentle. The ministries do not yet focus on climate change or reducing greenhouse gas emissions in their decision making. Well, they're central to actually meeting the government's targets. But as I said, <coughs> They understand this is no priority. No one's going to get ahead as a minister actually doing something on this file. No one's going to get ahead as a bureaucrat actually doing something on this file. So they happily and totally ignore it. Um, and uh, the Energy and Mines Ministry does not have an integrated long-term energy plan that aligns natural gas and electricity use in buildings with Ontario's 2030 emission reduction target. 
They don't even have a plan. Now, the government's environment plan has many elements that, as the Auditor General said, are not based on evidence. And I think that's a gentle way of saying they spitballed it. Hey, do you think this would be credible in a sentence? Yeah, I think it would be credible in a sentence. Well, Thank let's just you. put it in then. Thank you.